And thank you all for coming to this session, which is called Informative Evaluation, Successful Collaboration Between Analysts and Decision Makers. And we've got three speakers today. Uh, the first one is Lucy Sandell, who is a Senior Analytical Manager at NHS England. And then we've got Gareth Hooper, who is an analytics manager at the strategy unit and also a scientific, senior scientific advisor at NIHR. And he'll also be talking to his previous experience working in, as an analyst in, the, in an ICS. And then last but not least, we've got um, Minal Bakai, who's the national director for primary care transformation within NHS England. Thank you. Hello, so yeah, uh, I'm a senior analytical manager at NHS England and uh, I've been working there for about nine years doing mixed method theory-based evaluation. So the debate that prompted this talk is, uh, was uh, are theories of change worth the time it takes to develop if you're working rapidly? Uh, and a theory of change isn't often demanded. We're usually just given a question to answer or a topic to look at. Uh, but how frustrating it is when we don't know what assumptions they've made and how frustrating for them when we come back saying, it's more complex, we can't clearly answer your question. So that frustration obviously emerges from us and the decision makers having different roles and so different worldviews. And we need both worldviews to make effective change happen. So we need catalysts who push delivery and break down barriers. And we also need sense checkers and lesson learners who want to focus in on how it works. So dealing with that sort of magical thinking temptation that we were talking about this morning. And I feel that a theory of change acts as a bridge between how the decision makers think about their plans and how we think about them. So it helps us understand each other. And the process itself is even more important because it's a journey that they go on that helps them see the complexity and so puts us both on the same side. So let me illustrate that workshopping process. So these are the visible parts of a theory of change. We get the right people in the room and that's a range of stakeholders for our workshops and they put what they know onto post-it notes just like this. Uh, and so they start with the obvious. But then we start talking about what's underneath the surface. And structurally, there's not much room made for reflection and challenge in a lot of national programs. Many teams find the workshop valuable just for providing that space. Sometimes it's the first chance to think about the scale of the action you're able to take and the potential for change in that area. Some examples are plans to put out more guidance on a topic, for example, a theory of change would explore, are people going to use that guidance? Uh, does it remove the reasons that they weren't doing that thing in the first place? Or a plan that involves training midwives recently, for example, a theory of change will help explore whether you can overcome that many might cancel the training and explore whether with staff shortages there's potential to change. Can they implement the training you're giving them? And as NHS England commits to more collaborative working, it's a way to normalise that sort of consensus building in practice. And there's the potential for some substantial outcomes if we do it right. We've seen better evaluations happen as a result of working with theories of change, even in quite rapid environments, and that managed expectations is less frustration between us and them. These are the kinds of questions that we want to be encouraging decision makers to ask within our workshops. And afterwards, this is the kind of things we want them to be able to describe. But as a whole, the workshopping process can be quite messy, as you can see, and it needs some analytical skill to create a legible model from all that expert knowledge that gets dumped within the workshop. So let's explore an example theory of change. Here's an example diagram that describes how you can use them to build bridges. So if we start with that bottom section, let's start with the intellectual side. We can make the assumption that using the right facilitation skills, we can draw out the expert knowledge in the room. And then we need to do two things. We need to clarify what assumptions have been made because often the program themselves aren't clear what assumptions are being made. And be clear on the underlying causes, lose the superficial theories that might have got them as far as they've got, and really understand what's going on underneath uh, the, the surface. 
Then we're trying to understand what mechanisms for change exist, the active ingredients that will actually make the difference. And this is often we're describing how the change happens, not just what change happens. We're checking that the plan has a coherent theory, and we're showing how the, there's a combination of actions and context. How do those things combine? And then the cyclical, non-linear part of it is that as the program continues, we're trying to review the theory as evidence emerges and head over to our, our outcomes on the right there. But let's not forget the emotional side. Um, I've found that if you just do the bit on the bottom, we're not going to create bridges between us and our decision makers. What we really provide value in is holding space to talk honestly. We share our expertise within the workshop and help them have a better conversation than they would have had on their own. We're able to help them establish whether a good theory exists early on. And for programs with a solid theory, that really helps them to be able to sell their ideas. But even for programs where we work with them and they don't have a solid theory, it really helps them to offer uh, an explanation as to why the plan might need more development. That sort of modeling, consensus building, and learning is another nonlinear part of it. We do that in our relationship building as we go through the programs. And then we're hoping to spread that theory building skill so that more people can do these workshops and more of us get, get through that kind of work. And then lastly, the so what. So I think theory of change work and development processes change programs as well as uh, building bridges. So when, when we can assume that there, there is a reasonable base of knowledge and that decision makers know how their plan works and we then draw out that expertise, we can create learning cycles by being in at that stage of the development and those learning cycles can then inform the delivery and the evidence. The plans develop as we learn more, and those learning cycles continue and grow. We end up with communities of practice and ways of gathering evidence from what's going on and how people are adapting what was originally planned. And what we've found so far is that we think we're likely to see those outcomes happen more if you, pr if you go through the continuous learning process because you understand far more about what happens on the ground when your nice neat plan hits the real world. But you also get a much better evidence base for effective improvement in the future. And one thing we are not very good at in the NHS is organizational memory. So being able to gather and keep that learning is super important. Uh, it also means that that learning means that the next generation of programs would have a clearer theory of change. And that's what I've taken you through. The process of brainstorming what we know and seeing it reflected back as a legible model can be a powerful tool to building understanding between analysts and decision makers. Hi everyone, my name's Gareth Hooper and I've worked in local government and the NHS for the bulk of my career and the first half of that was in service delivery and providing services and the moment I moved into evaluation, I met a chap called Hugh McLeod who was then at Birmingham University, he's now at Bristol University and we were commissioning services and Hugh was a health economist in residence at Gloucestershire CCG for six months and Hugh talked through some of the economic thought processes that might go into commissioning and that was the first time I thought do I actually know how to use my job if I'm not carrying out some of these thought processes as opposed to hunches and ideas that are kind of crowdsourced from colleagues. So now I work in impact evaluation, I work at the strategy unit and, um, and, and spend part-time secondment at the NIHR. And so I want to discuss some of the opportunities for collaboration in health and social care and integrated care systems and what we might do with less than perfect information. And a lot of this might talk to Arna's points this morning around some of the constraints and the challenges that we have when we're making decisions with, with scarce resources. And those might be scarce evaluation resources as well as the resources for services. So we know that integrated care systems make decisions and they make it with less than perfect information. So we have to have collaborative evaluation. When I've worked in ICSs and before that CCGs, 
there was a lot of evaluation activity, which is a good thing, but it was not always called evaluation, and as a consequence, was not always treated robustly enough. I had a fairly unique role for a little while as an evaluation lead in an ICS, and it's quite unusual to have that, and it might be more usual to have business intelligence or analysts that are producing quantitative evaluations with little or no opportunity for mixed methods or qualitative input. So in my first evaluation role on a CCG, I was actually working in primary care commissioning. And a few of us got together and formed an informal evaluation group. It was made up of colleagues from public health, business intelligence, and other people in the CCG who just literally had an interest in good evaluation. So that's both on the one hand brilliant that we were given the space and the time to do that within our jobs, but it was an informal group. It was not necessary. Decisions could be made outside of our thoughts and processes but you have to go with what you've got, and that was the early dawn of evaluation in, in, my, in my career. The type of evaluations that occurred in ICS that we were asked to discuss was, was significantly complex. So we were asked to understand whether new services for rehabilitation for acquired brain injury, are they cost effective? Does a community-based frailty service save money and deliver better outcomes for patients and carers? And is social prescribing cost saving? So these are very complex and far too difficult for informal groups, even for those who have a you know, for what I had as a single-handed evaluation function in, in an ICB. But it comes in reflecting on these complex evaluation questions that shows the questions that senior leaders are asking and how can we bridge the disconnect between the research community that would know the efforts that would have to go into that to robustly answer and those NHS decision makers that are usually making a quick decision usually within a financial year based on budgetary or policy constraints. So in the middle of financial, clinical and commissioning and management functions, there's a lot of work to get an activity underway. Setting up an intervention is a lot of hard work and funds have to be secured, staff have to be made available and new models of delivery are set up. Analysts are often at the start and the end of that process. At the start, as Arna discussed this morning, there could be a dashboard or report that said a service should be redesigned because there's a signal in the data that suggests there's inequity or a subpopulation group that is costing an awful lot of money. And so therefore, that might be a driver for change. And then at the end of that process, the same analyst that produced the dashboard or the report might be asked, did the intervention that we put in place solve the problem that your report identified? Did it work? So the analysts sit at the start and the, 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 at the end. And those analytical reports at the start, those dashboards, are justifiably carry a lot of weight in an ICS or an ICB. And this is for several reasons. Using an organisation's own data to highlight a problem is a powerful tool. It's very persuasive that something needs to be changed. It's not national data extrapolated. This is our own real data with patients that we meet. And this makes a project feel very doable and very personal. Secondly, analysts are excellent at presenting data well. Long gone are the tables tucked away in appendices. Now we present data beautifully in software packages, which is accessible and readable to a, a much wider audience. But of course, I think that's possibly a double-edged sword. And thirdly, people treat numbers with deference. Many a throwaway figure has become a scientific fact with an institution. And quantitative, quantitative analysis is esoteric, and few people feel confident to scrutinise an analytical report. So here's my first point for collaboration. That whilst an analytical report may demonstrate a problem, how do we cautiously question the case for change? Does our data mat, match with national trends? Is there any evidence that we can actually change or modify that problem? Have other studies tried and failed, or tried and succeeded, exactly what we're planning to do. It's about bringing as much expertise as possible to identify the problem and create an evidence-based solution. It's very appealing to feel, find problems through data that once solved could improve outcomes or make savings, but it's equally valuable to test whether the improvements are feasible, that the desired outcomes are plausible, and that the impact is evaluable. So I'd recommend a couple of actions at the early start stages of service redesign. And that's to carry out a literature search around the very intervention that you're attempting to solve. Is there evidence that our problem can be solved? If so, over what time frame and what resources are required? 
and how many studies show this and what type of studies. So critically analysing and trying to understand whether there's any mileage in doing what we're even trying to do. And as Arne suggested, he's reaching out to partners and colleagues. I think it's important to choose wisely. Um, and I would suggest that local universities, NIHR, Research Support Service, ARCs, Health Innovation Networks, might be a good starting point. Researchers with expertise in the areas of interest will give NHS decision makers a great insight into what outcomes can be expected if changes are made to the service. Analysts without evaluation expertise can take advice from the type of methodology required to demonstrate impact and whether the ICS has sufficient resources to manage that is crucial to managing future expectations and improving the quality of future evaluations. So these are the type of questions that have been asked of business intelligence teams and ICSs where I've worked. They're very difficult to answer. Evaluation skills and resources in ICS are scarce. Some have more than others, but it's not likely that these questions can be answered accurately. I think these questions possibly belong in a planning stage for each intervention to be answered initially using evidence synthesis before we proceed. So is there any evidence that virtual wards save money? For those that were in Joe Dunville's session this morning, there's this, this idea of low to moderate evidence. And so what do we do with that as a decision maker? How do we solve inequity? What does, what does social prescribing mean in terms of cost savings? So if we bring these to the planning stage and use existing evidence, again, that can direct the direction that we might take. The second point for collaboration is not waiting until the new service has been implemented to evaluate its impact. If these questions must be answered and evidence for robust sources suggest a positive outcome to the intervention, the intervention implementation should be planned with evaluation in mind. That could include rollout, a skilled team of adequate resources to evaluate the question being set. It may even be possible to work collaboratively with a local university to carry out a robust evaluation. But within the evaluation, is there a point in the early findings or the formative report? Is there a threshold for success or failure? Is there a signal in the data that is prescribed from the outset that says, if X equals this, it's not working? Or if X equals that, then we carry on? If the evaluation can't answer the big questions, such as cost effectiveness, then maybe we could find a question that can be answered from the data. The answerable question might be significantly more simplistic and less informative but its strength is in being accurate and robust. For example, introducing a patient outcome or an experience measure which indicates success or failure of an intervention without the need for comparative co control group. If the question of cost effectiveness cannot be answered, but patients are having a good experience and a good outcome. This may be enough to know if a service is performing well. And so through a natural experiment design, it may be possible to construct a study group to look at the effect of the interventions on patients who are assigned the intervention. The most important part about the evaluation process here is that the data isn't just explained away, either positively or negatively, because it's either not understood or there's just simply too little of it. A lot of the decisions will hang off the numbers that analysts report about a service, and these numbers might be affected by selection bias, regression to the mean, or confounding. And these are hard concepts to pick up for NHS managers who aren't, have a background in research. In a simple pre-post evaluation design, there's a lot of potential bias and error that makes results look more positive or negative than they actually are. And so the main part of the collaboration is that there is an honesty about the process and where there's less than perfect information that it's treated cautiously and not over-optimistically. So in trying to sum up the thoughts around collaboration, ICSs necessarily carry out evaluations in a rapid way but may develop questions that can't be answered without significant resource. This means future decisions will be informed by less than perfect information. So if we find evidence from elsewhere that's reliable, we can use that to design our evaluations and make early decisions. If there's no evidence at all, then we should proceed with caution in inviting expertise. If there is evidence, we should use it to develop an evaluation plan. Lucy has already talked through the importance of theories of change and intervention. And if we ask the right evaluation questions as part of the decision-making process, given the skills of the team, what we know about similar changes and other evaluation processes, then we can ask what's our evaluation question that we need to know. And so I'm going to put a call to action for researchers out there that if you reach out to an ICS and ask them what are the issues that are keeping them awake at night, 
that request might not always be warmly met, but for sure there are decisions that people are making that I think could well be supported by your thoughts and, and reaching out. Hi everyone, um, so I'm Menal. Um, I'm uh, also a GP, a practicing GP in Northwest London in a very deprived part of Northwest London in Harlesden, um, in addition to my national role. And I think we'd all agree that bridging the evidence practice gap in health services has the potential to make substantial improvement both in terms of health outcomes, service, service efficiency, but also avoid research waste. Um, and as a national program, we have taken multiple approaches to embed um, our ability to enhance the relevance and the dissemination of research findings to both strengthen our understanding and our approach to primary care transformation. So I'm sure you will all know uh, that general practice is under considerable pressure. Uh, demand is increasing, complexity is rising, we are seeing a fall in our GP capacity, and going forwards, modelling suggests that these pressures will become even more acute with an ageing population and rising multimorbidity. Uh, furthermore, these challenges are not evenly distributed, so we know that practices serving the most deprived areas are more strongly impacted, and we can see from our data that the growth in activity in these areas is slowing down compared to the growth in need, um, and that suggests that we're getting to saturation point in some areas of the country. Um, and so while we absolutely need to focus on growing our workforce, our capacity, retaining our workforce, we also need to transform our ways of working. And for general practice, that means moving away from a first come, first serve model, one size fits all, to one that is fairer, safer and more sustainable. And that is what we are calling modern general practice. Um, a modern general practice, it's been born from the innovative work of general practices um, to better align existing capacity to need, um, improve patient experience and staff experience at work. Um, it was accelerated during the pandemic where we saw um, a fast uptake um, of digitally supported access and triage. Um, but it's a really complex model. Uh, first of all, it involves a whole team. It touches on both our administrative teams and our clinical teams. It involves the redesign of our clinical protocols, our workflows, staff training, um, embedding uh, data and digital tools, and building improvement capabilities within our teams for continual improvement and iteration. And at the start of the pandemic, the evidence base for large-scale service transformation, and particularly digital transformation in primary care, was limited. Um, and so we have implemented multiple approaches to generate new, new evidence and insights. Um, and as you can see, evaluating the whole model is incredibly complex. It's nuanced and it requires a, a range of different expertise and insights. And this includes um, a range of different research approaches, in-depth knowledge of primary care and primary care data, the ability to pull together complex insights from a variety of different research and interpret them as part of a whole model of change and uh, taking into consideration both the real world context, which is incredibly messy, as well as the evolving, continual evolving maturity of digital and data tools, because none of this stands still. And so to generate evidence, uh, we focused on four approaches. So the first was really embedding policy, clinical and research partnerships. Um, and we have an excellent partnership with the Health Foundation Improvement Analytics Unit. I can see Geraldine in, in the audience, and she is my fellow collaborator. Um, and, you know, we've had a brilliant approach working together um, to improve the availability of relevant, timely evidence to help inform decision-making at a policy level, but also ensure that that research is more likely to be used. And I'm in a unique position, being both a clinician and a policymaker. So, 
particularly when thinking about what are the right questions to ask, I take a very realist world view of what it's like on the front line, on the ground, delivering services to my patients as well as from a policy perspective. Um, and we've worked very much hand in glove, taking a co-production approach. So we've combined our various skills and expertise of our teams. Um, we've engaged with the complexity, and that's through high levels of collaboration. We would meet every other week. Um, we would you know, check the relevance of what we were doing, frequent discussions, feedback. Um, present findings as they emerge and I think that's really really important because actually the real world questions are pretty messy um, and crowded uh, and I think it was really important that the ideas were policy and clinically initiated because they were then really focused on tackling some of the most immediate and critical issues uh, where evidence was most needed uh, to both guide decision making um, but also therefore well targeted for real world impact. Um, we were, uh, we were <laughs> um, involved in shaping the research agenda uh, very much together. Um, and that resulted in some very practical outcomes. We heard this morning about uh, the outcome not just being more research, more research, more research, but actually we produced some really practical out outcomes as well as um, you know, scope for more research. Um, and I think also the work generated a better understanding of the policy context. And so Geraldine and her team have been able to apply that to other work with other partners, uh, which I think is really, really important. Um, I think some of the key things for me were that our ways of working struck the right balance between a pragmatic research design that helped to meet policy timelines, um, but also um, embedding scientifically excellent design, particularly the kind of innovative, uh, quantitative analytic models that the Health Foundation and the Improvement Analytics Unit in particular are so well known for. Um, but we also produced both valued research outputs, so peer-reviewed publications, as well as making sure that we had some really strong insights to inform my decision-making and my team's decision-making nationally and weaving this into particularly critical enablers um, to translate the findings into real practical change on the ground. Um, and I think just some of the critical success factors that I would reflect on for effective policy, clinical policy research partnerships were that we spent a lot of time really making sure we had some shared aims and goals. We invested a lot in our long-term partnership and that relationship building and the time that we spent together. I think that was supported by the fact of, that we had stability within our teams and so we didn't have this kind of churn of staff. There very much was an equal partnership, so we shared credit through co-authorship and shared publicity of findings. We did blogs together and that sort of thing high levels of engagement and sustained communication as I discussed, but we also co-produced across every stage of the research. And we had some very clear governance and processes, particularly around publication policy, comms approaches, etc., cetera, um, and work plans, um, milestones, roles and responsibilities. Secondly, I embedded a research function nationally into my team to bring together a wider breadth of research expertise. We had some brilliant quantitative expertise from the Improvement Analytics Unit, but we also brought in qualitative research, user research and service design to, uh, to broaden the diversity of research, sk research skills, which was so important in looking at that complexity of the model. And this really helped us build both a kind of improvement approach that we heard about again earlier today where we would generate rapid insights that we could act on we could iterate um, as we went on and you know really adapt what we were doing um, as well as some of those longer term insights uh, to understand impact and I think that's really important when we're thinking about implementation um, and, and having that breadth of research expertise Thirdly, uh, we set up a knowledge sharing research and evaluation network. So showcasing evidence from independently commissioned studies, we brought academics and other researchers together um, to share their findings with policymakers, national teams, the Department of Health and Social Care, 
and in particular, it was a safe space to share emerging findings and confidence. It was really important to then be able to triangulate that with what other researchers were finding to give us a clear steer or signal around uh, what was the kind of 80% direction of travel. Um, and also an opportunity for us to share our research policies to influence future research work. And then finally, knowledge brokers. So people like me that sit at the intersection uh, where we can start to translate that knowledge into practice, whether that's through training, uh, through our support programs, uh, comms, engagement with um, clinicians and the profession, but also our work with integrated um, care boards as well as policy um, and we were able to leverage our collective connections so I have a lot of clinical networks that I work with as well as the integrated care boards and so that helped particularly with the qualitative work to bring practices on board and a diverse range of practices where often people struggle to, to galvanize participants for research um, and so that I think that was really really valuable. In terms of what worked well, I think we produced some high quality relevant evidence that has been integral to supporting some of our national policy decisions um, and also to support us making the right decisions and guiding that decision making. We used our skills and knowledge in a complementary way. We were able to integrate um, tacit experiential knowledge to provide that critical nuance to underpin study design, implementation and analysis. Um, and by working together, there was collective access to specific resources, particularly national data sets that are not necessarily publicly available. Um, uh, like I said, there was mutual respect and equal partnership um, uh, for the work. Um, and actually, it was really helpful for me because it meant that I had people with research expertise who were working in the space that I that I was leading in that I could call on for timely expert research advice to share emerging findings and sort of a bit like phone a friend. Um, and I think the other thing that really supported the way of working was that there was a shared multi-year funding model with the improvement analytics unit. So we didn't necessarily have all of the headache of commissioning cycles, which was really helpful, but that let us focus really on that long-term relationship approach so we could do the rapid as well as the longitudinal. I mean, there are of course challenges, and we've heard about these earlier, particularly around timelines, um, that there is a lot of complexity within the evaluation of digital health and service transformation in primary care. Particularly, we have data that arises from multiple different GP, IT systems, and how you pull all of that together with wider system data sets as well. Access to good quality data, so we have a lot of, lot of data, but not necessarily, it's all very coded very well and easy to extract and interpret, and that can be quite time consuming. Um, you know, time and capacity of patients, communities, and staff to participate, but through our networks, that's been really helpful to galvanize support for the work that we're doing. But I think it's also really important to say that the research partnerships are really time intensive, um, and they need us all to lean in uh, to deliver that impact. Uh, and I think it's really critical for us to be then be able to impact, demonstrate the impact of that partnership approach to making the ca case for longer term investment in that relationship. And we again, we heard this morning the challenge of communicating complex findings to different audiences, having simple messages, but also then also wanting to caveat that with the but. And, um, and so it's, you know, making sure that again, collectively, we can do that to suit different audiences. Um, but in terms of then being able to translate that knowledge into practice, we have the ability to influence multiple critical enablers, a complex change. We need a whole system approach and multiple um, uh, parts of the system to lean in to actually increase the reach and the scale of benefits. And that's one of the things that we've really been able to do through the work that we've done together. Um, and through this embedded research approach to really ensure that we're underpinning um, all of our critical enablers with an evidence base and then iterating and refining as we learn and go along. And that is really making the biggest change in practice. 
And so my key messages are that I think co-production is really worthwhile and worth investing time and energy and effort into. Um, and from, from my experience, particularly around complex service change and implementation evaluations, it's been um, really, really effective. Um, an embedded research function has really supported the programme uh, that I lead to build an evidence-driven approach to national policy and strategy. Um, I think that these longer-term partnerships can provide rapid and longitudinal evidence, uh, but we need that multi-year multi funding. It's like continuity of care with my patients. Um, I don't have to keep repeating my story with every new research team. Uh, we understand each other and that can save us lots of time and effort and energy, but also produce far better, more in-depth findings. Um, and the knowledge sharing networks that cut across lots of different um, stakeholders, policy, clinical, academic, and research communities can really help promote that evidence-based policy making. But that requires a lot of effort, leadership, um, and sustained commitment. And also, again, coming back to relationships, they're really at the heart of all of this. Thank you. Um, so there's going to be roving mix going, going around in a second, just while we get that sorted and also to give you two minutes to think about it, I'll, I'll ask the first question. Um, Thank you, everyone, very much. That was uh, really insightful and lots of things to think about. Um, Minal, you talk quite a lot about the enablers and barriers to successful collaboration, and I was wondering if I could ask Lucy and Gareth, um, in your perspectives, what, what do you think are those enablers and barriers? Um, well, I talked a little bit about it. I think there's something around the different roles that us and the decision makers have where um, we can find each other frustrating sometimes, but we can also have great respect for each other and each other's roles. And you do need both uh, roles to make things happen well. But I think we rely on a system to ensure some mutual respect. And sometimes I think we end up falling into feeling frustrated with individuals, but actually the system might be setting us up to clash. So the trust building work that we do is an enabler, but occasionally the system will let us down because it doesn't offer that support for creating a space where there's respect for both kinds of roles. Like having developers and testers in IT, you need both, right? <laughs> so uh, yeah, we need both. I think one of the barriers is necessarily the time taken to look at the evidence, implement it, and, and when the decision is going to be made. If there's a decision in very quickly need to be made, then it's hard to look at evidence or bring anybody. So I think as, as the, the time period in which something has to, a decision be made, and how evidence can get into that decision is important. So I think an enabler is how that can be pushing. So what's the critical friend look like? That the service doesn't have to be the best, but it can just be better. So we talked this morning um, around trying to get down to one paragraph, and maybe we just implement one thing that's better than it was. So I think an enabler is making it easy to do one thing that's better within the time frame that the decision is going to be made in. Again, Chris with his idea of it's best to get 80% right in time than 100% right a day afterwards. So I think time's the limiting factor, but the way we can enable it is make it easy and just do that one thing in that period of time that's available. And have you got anything you'd like to... Yeah, um, I mean, I guess the only other thing I would add uh, to what I said was, um, I think it's the leadership, you know, we heard about it this morning, but talking about why evidence matters and changing the language and, you know, with my team, I'm always, again, similarly going, what's the evidence? And actually I'm saying, but what's the impact? That's fine, we're doing that, but what's the impact? And how do we improve our impact? And that's the kind of culture that you, that you then try and set, which is around a learning system. So we're constantly trying to improve on what we're, what we're achieving um, and improving our impact. And then you need the evidence, the improvement approaches to really help you do that. Um, so yeah, culture and leadership. Thank you. Interesting about the, the language point that you just made though. I'm getting in here with one more thing. Um, it, I was actually speaking to somebody earlier today and was talking about the, the, the concept of theory of change isn't something that, that 
people understand. So people working in the, in the service are not familiar with that as a, as a concept. And um, in productivity as well, we were talking about different definitions for the same thing. It seems to be sort of a bit of a, a theme about, a, a, around language and, and how you, you explain things. And I have learned a lot. I see Gabe. He, he's my head of research and evaluation. He's amazing. And, you know, he has, he has led our theory of change, but is always talking about benefits. Um, and I think, you know, again, having more and more people in your teams that are talking the, the same talk is really important. Thank you. OK, we'll move out to the audience now. Has anybody got any, any questions? Don't be shy. Oh, um, Fraser. You can't be to overcome my shyness. The, I, I can't hold an awkward silence for very long. The room is doing a good job <laughs> of generating one. Um, one of the benefits that I can see analysts and evaluators and researchers possibly having in their relationship with decision makers is sort of narrowing the scope for madness. Do you know what I mean? Sort of shut it, shutting out scope for the sort of lunatic scheme that we've seen two or three years previously, but have forgotten that we did. But that puts quite a lot of strain into the relationship, doesn't it? Because if you're the analyst and you're saying to the decision maker, this is madness, can we please not do this? Or can we, you know, be first back in a different way? I just wonder if anyone on the panel have got any examples of analysis or evaluation showing that kind of value. It's the things that don't get done. So it's not, it's not the classic positive story of produce evidence, do something good with that evidence, then the world is better. It's produce evidence, stop the mad scheme from occurring. The world is better, but we just don't see it. So I don't know if anyone on the panel has got reflections on that. Um, I've certainly got reflections on reframing it. <laughs> um, yeah, a lot of the time, because a lot of what we do doesn't get published, people don't know what happened two or three years ago, um, even if it happened within the same organization. So. Um, Yes, the reframing, narrowing room for madness as we know where the reports are. <laughs> Do you want us to share them with you? And you can learn all the lessons they learned uh, rather than starting from scratch. We've seen three generations of similar programs uh, within the last decade start as if the previous programs hadn't happened. Uh, so wherever we can stop that, that's great. That is more difficult, though, if you're not publishing. Yeah. How, do, how do you ensure that that learning does get shared? Um, well, we share a lot of stuff through our community of practice. I think communities of practice are great for that kind of stuff. Um, and we, we talk to each other a lot. But really, a lot of this stuff is in a folder somewhere. And I, I have to say, when I was working in pharmacy, there was quite a lot of it that sort of reflected some of the stuff that happened with nurse practitioners a decade before. But all the organizations who'd done those local evaluations had ceased to be. <laughs> I couldn't find a single evaluation that had survived those organizations ending. So organizational knowledge is a huge issue and has been for oh, at least 20 years at this point. I think the... Um the madness question. I mean, in the world we live in at the moment, Elon Musk kind of splits uh, the populations about whether it's mad or absolutely brilliant what the guy's doing, isn't it? And I think so. There's a real the, the, the world of what we live in is looking for exciting, exceptional technological solutions now to the problems, the intractable problems that we've looked for a long time. So I think madness and eccentricity now is gathering a lot of momentum. And so when we're seeking for that that, that ultimate um, solution that we, we will look more and more into the mad world. I think it's getting more difficult now to shut down madness because is it genius or is it madness? At what point do we really know? And I think we might be erring on the side of genius in some of the ideas. Um, I think the, the only way I've ever found it's possible is if it stopped very, very early on because ideas that are very attractive can gain momentum for a heck of a long time. They, they, you know, we don't, we're not going to put to bed an idea until we've absolutely proven it, it doesn't work, but even then we might not might struggle. So I think the kudos for solving an intractable problem, the person who's come up with it, there's, there's a lot of people waiting for that solution. And a uh, senior NHS uh, director once said to me, a lot of, lot of um, interventions are doomed to success. 
So they're going to happen. They're just going to happen. They're too attractive not to. So I think it's really difficult. And I often look at the pharmaceutical industry as interested to know when do they stop a molecule? At what point in their trials do they put an end to a molecule? And I've often wondered how we can, we can do something similar where we can say the trial is not working. Well done, everybody. Let's extrapolate the cost of what we would have had, convert it into a savings, and, and pat someone on the back for ending the trial. But, um, but I think it's really difficult, for right. sure. Yeah, I mean, I guess uh, I would say that often as a clinician and sort of bringing that frontline experience to the fore, you can often say, but as a clinician, I'm not quite sure if that's really the priority. Um, because you don't always need the evidence base. If you know, you know the reality of what's happening on the ground and you can probably call these things out a mile away. So part of it's having the right people in the room at the beginning of the conversation and ideally having clinicians that work up at the front line. Um, but I think, you know, as Lucy said again, that organisational memory, that sharing or sharing it somewhere, even if it's not openly published, but publishing it on future NHS, that NHS staff have access to it, even if it's not in the public, public domain is, you know, helpful. Um, but I think that's also the importance of having these networks because there's often somebody that does remember and will, will be able to help strengthen your, your case if, if you need some more evidence to support that as well. Um, uh, but yeah, uh, you know, I guess it, it's got to take a collective a, a approach to, to managing that. Yeah, of course. Yeah, I, I think the other thing is, um, as an extension of what I was saying in my presentation, I don't think a bad plan has ever survived intact one of my workshops because you get them to tell you how it works and as they can't tell you, they realise it doesn't work. Like, I'm not telling them, I'm not confronting them, they tell me. And so theory of change is hugely powerful for getting them to say, does it work? It's the process of making it's the, the theory process, of change. It's the process, not the diagram. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Not the end product. Yeah. Or not the written. Product. Yeah, yeah. Okay. okay. Uh, here at the front, Tachan. Oh, and then, and then behind you, Sarah. Um, thanks so much. Um, as someone who just works in research, I think it's really easy to connect with other researchers through like webinars or networks and so on. But. I wouldn't really know how to find a policy maker to make use of my research in the same way as easily. So it'd be great to hear more about Manal. How did you set up that initial relationship with Geraldine? And do you have any? Does anyone have any tips for like how can you make your research more visible to policy makers? Yeah, um, you're testing my memory, and I wonder if Geraldine remembers how we first met because I'm not sure I do. Um, I think we had a colleague, a mutual colleague. So I think it comes back to being curious and saying, well, the evidence matters. The evidence matters to me, so who can help me with the evidence? And I think we had a mutual colleague who said, oh, I know somebody that would be you know, good for you to talk to. And, and they were kind of our connector. Um, uh, and, and that's how we then built the relationship going forwards. So I think it, it does need somebody that's curious from a policy perspective to really instigate, but then you need people to help you connect to the, the right uh, folk in the research space where they've got an interest or are doing, um, have the skills to help you um, investigate or explore what you're trying to do. Um, so I think it's the combination of the two. I think the more that we in, in the policy space can really talk about evidence more and more, and I think you know some of that is trust, so people might um, originally, initially sort of go, okay, well, we kind of trust her, so let her, let her roll with this. Um, and then, you know, the outputs speak for themselves and it kind of snowballs. So, so, so some of that is the, in the gift of the policymaker to build those relationships, to build that trust, to build that autonomy, to, to do that work. Um, so I think then it comes back to how do you build up that culture? I think we are moving in that direction. The more and more conversations that I'm in, I certainly hear um, conversations about the evidence. I think the fact that there are actually quite a lot of people from NHS England here at this conference speaks for itself as well. So I think the more that we can have 
integrated spaces where we're all together and can listen and learn, I think that will again help hopefully uh, ignite some of those, those relationships. Gareth, have you got anything that you can say from a sort of ICS, sort of local point of view? Yeah, so I'm going to give a shout out to Serendipity um, and just asking people who knows someone, who knows someone, who knows someone. So um, we can often have these databases of people who have expertise in certain areas and we keep that database, but there's nothing like just knowing someone and asking, say, do you know anybody that's interested in this? And I think you can go a long way with that rather than these formulated databases where people move jobs and things like that. And, um, and one of the roles in NIHR, we try to find policy experts around different areas to look at our research. And the, the, again, the approach of asking people I know within my network, do you know somebody I should ask? And you can often find that person you know, o over time. And it, it doesn't take very long now, either Twitter or various other mechanisms to find out people. And so I think, I'm, yeah, I'm going to give a shout out to Seren Serendipity. I think you've got to be curious. You've got to go out there. But I think, yeah, asking people who know someone, especially in these networks today. I mean, I've met two or three extra people today that I now know to ask someone. So I think um, networks, the old fashioned way, I think is still really, really joyful. And last time I was speaking at this conference, I was recruiting for the then very new community of practice. So I would recommend, come and join our community <laughs> of practice. You can ask anyone you like and someone will know. <laughs> Great, thank you so much. Thank you. Um, so I was wondering about the theme of sort of open learning and the sharing space for uh, sort of policy making and learning, and particularly around de-implementation. And I'm wondering how we can sort of try and develop a bit more the kind of environment where it's okay to have that sort of analysis, um, information, evaluation that shows that something actually isn't working and should continue and how we can actually share that because uh, well, I have been involved at a national level on several pieces which haven't, um, haven't gone the way I guess senior decision makers would want it, but unfortunately you're not able to share that learning and I do think it's valuable to be able to do that. So I'm just wondering how do we think we might be able to try and tip the tide the other way to be able to share some of that? Thank you, great question. Uh, well, I, th I think it's worth acknowledging that while we can create bubbles of a learning culture, generally we don't work in a very learning positive environment. Uh, and that one of the reasons why people get defensive when you give them the wrong answer is their whole career might be based on the success of that program. You know, the, the system is set up in a, such a way that it makes it hard for them to be open to learning. So I think it's about us being able to think about how the system places us into certain roles and what we can do to create spaces where we can learn. Um, for example, the, the sort of program funding stream itself can create silos and competition and being able to be that role where you can help groups collaborate with each other who are working in similar spheres can do an awful lot to create a learning environment and understand how things are interacting uh, and things like, you know, creating you know, connections with improvement teams whose role it is locally to think about these things can help too. So, yeah. That's a good point. Uh, so, I mean, de-implementation happens very quickly when there's budget cuts. I mean, people find a way very, very quickly then that, that two or three years previously to the budget necessity was, was no talk. So I think the question is how can we de-implement when there's no financial constraint? How can we do it in a way that's organic? So, I think there's always, what does doesn't work means, and that wouldn't need exploring. Is it, is it dangerous, is it, is it losing us money, or is it just low value, and what does low value mean? And then there's those stakeholders, those people who are employed in that service. What might that service mean? Where would those patients go? So I think there's that rebridging. So what we, how would we slowly unpick something in a way where we can gently move it somewhere else and take people with us? I think it's really hard, but if we take this idea that one day a budget impact assessment will be carried out and we'll find something that's too expensive, how can we routinely look for low value and bring everyone with us in the movement? And I think, I think that's really difficult. Um, and, and I think there's often the pressure is, is necessity being the mother of all invention. I think necessity and, and budgets usually make that process very quick and very poor, but, um, but yeah. I think for me, it's about planning. So I think it's about really being systematic in your approach. Um, you know, you've got a theory of change, you're quite clear on the, outcomes that you're monitoring 
Um, I think there's something about having then that kind of iterative improvement approach, so you, you learn early, so it's not three years down the line, people have invested time, loads of money in a programme, and that reputational risk that people worry about. So I think there's something about being putting a lot of energy up front around that planning stage. I think it's also being really clear at the start, what's a test? Um, you know, I know we don't like to use the word pilot, but you know, what are you actually testing? Um, I think we've got to recognise, and you know, we were talking about this earlier, but actually most innovation does fail initially, you know, it's, but it's about intelligent failure, it's about being able to learn from that and then decide, well, do you iterate, can you improve and, and build to success, or actually have you learnt that this is the wrong path to go down? But I think the clearer you are at the outset about what's the test, not jumping straight into spread and scale too quickly, it means that you set expectations, and then once you've set expectations, it's much easier to say, okay, well, we learnt this, it didn't achieve what we expected it to, so we're pivoting here, and that's a much easier conversation to have down the line, but you've got to do the work up front. Yeah. The, the strategy unit runs a, um, a sort of a training course, I don't know if, um, uh, sort of around decision making, and um, I went to one recently that um, Fraser was was um, uh, leading on. And the thing, one of the things that sort of stuck with me was the idea that we should be in a position. Coming back to what mm. you were saying, Lucy, about we should be judging on process, not mm. on outcomes. Yes. So if you implement something, if it fails, that isn't a failure on your part, yeah. unless the process wasn't um, wasn't robust. But but it, it's about changing that kind of. Moving away from a blame culture, where if somebody does a, uh, evaluates something and, and it turns out that it actually wasn't cost effective or, or whatever, then that that doesn't that's learning. That's a positive mm. thing, um, and, and improving based on that. Thank you very much. I think we might be up. For, mm. We're out of time. <laughs> well, thank you so much, everybody, for uh, coming along, um, and a big round of applause to our speakers. Thank you.